And I think John Hess's remarks on uh, the United States has already made its cuts uh, is the perfect segue into our next panel discussion. Um, a conversation with OPEC and the IEA, and we're very privileged to have senior officials from both those organizations with us. So at this juncture, I'd like to invite uh, Alex Schindler, who's based here in London. He's the news editor, Eastern Hemisphere, with Energy Intelligence to introduce his panel. Welcome, everybody. Um, this is our session on energy markets and oil policy. Uh, we are pleased to have uh, two of the heads of uh, the most influential energy organizations in the industry with us today to discuss an issue that uh, has dominated headlines for the last two years, which is no surprise to anyone. It's the state of the global oil markets. Uh, the industry has been desperate to know uh, over the last two years when and increasingly if oil prices will recover. Back in November 2014, OPEC made a strategic decision not to intervene in oil markets. Uh, and this was in essence just to leave fundamentals and prices to be determined by um, market forces for the first time in decades. Uh, I think we were having a discussion backstage. This process has been more painful and taken longer than many had expected. Uh, two years later, prices are still at $50 a barrel, less than 50% off the highs in 2014. Uh, the market is still oversupplied. Inventories are still near around historic highs. In essence, we're still searching for answers. Then last month, we had, a, we had some sort of an answer. OPEC met in Algeria. Uh, they gave a sliver of hope. Uh, perhaps Mohammed thinks it's, it's, it's more than a sliver. Uh, that uh, OPEC would help speed the rebalancing of markets. OPEC made a unanimous decision to cut production to 32.5 to 33 million barrels a day. Uh, that is supposed to be done in November. There's still some work to be done on that. I'm sure we'll discuss that today. But if they finalize this deal, it will in essence be the first cut OPEC has made uh, since 2008. So to discuss this and many other uh, issues that will come up, I have uh, two distinguished speakers. They need very little introduction. Uh, we have Mohamed Barkindo, who is the OPEC uh, Secretary General, and then Fatih Biro, who is the Executive Director of the International Energy Agency. Welcome, both of you. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, Mohamed, I'd like to start with you on the first question here, which I'm, I'm sure a lot of people want to know the answer of. Basically, since you've taken the job as Secretary General since August, I think you've basically been on a plane the whole time, shuttling between OPEC capitals and Vienna. You were in Istanbul last week. Uh, can you tell us what still needs to be done to get a deal in Vienna next month? Uh, thank you very much, and uh, good, uh, good afternoon. Good morning. Good morning. I think we're still in the morning. <laughs> still morning. It's close. Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, distinguished uh, colleagues and friends. Uh, let me begin by saying how uh, uh, glad I am here to participate uh, at this 37th edition of Oil and Money. Uh, I think uh, we should congratulate Oil and Money for uh, having uh, survived and grown uh, to this uh, international uh, established uh, gathering of industry uh, in London. Uh, many others had started and could not survive the rough and tumble of the times, the various cycles of uh, oil and energy. Uh, so I would like to join many other delegates uh, to this conference uh, in congratulating the organizers and sponsors of oil and money and also uh, for uh, the very loyal uh, delegates, uh, I, I've seen so many. We were talking with my friend Fatih before we came on stage uh, that uh, uh, oil and money has a captive uh, 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 audience. Uh, year after year, they have been very loyal, and you see most of them here. So I think uh, we all deserve to congratulate ourselves, and we look forward to. Uh, this gathering growing in strength uh, for many, many years to come. 
Yes, uh, a lot had happened uh, in the last uh, two months or so. Now it looks like it's much longer than uh, the time I assumed <coughs> office in, in Vienna. Uh, uh, many friends I met here this morning uh, said, uh, you are the symbol of uh, the Chinese saying that may we live in interesting times. Uh, and I cannot agree more uh, than them. Yes, uh, Algiers uh, was a turning point. Uh, uh, we had embarked on the, a rebalancing of the market after the uh, crash of 2014, uh, which uh, uh, people in the trading community will call it probably correction. But that's not a correction that anyone would like to see again. Uh, I, must, I must confess. And when this correction took place, I think both my friend Fathi and myself, we did not anticipate, and our colleagues in Paris and in Vienna did not anticipate that it was going to take this long. Uh, I think the industry expected uh, probably a shorter correction and a rebalancing thereafter, and then continuous robust growth uh, going forward. But this had taken much longer than expected. And maybe I can share with you uh, my takeaway from the last fall meeting of the IMF in Washington about a week ago when Madame Christine Lagarde described uh, the global economic growth in these words, uh, uh, that the growth, the global economic growth uh, has been too low, uh, too slow uh, for too long, and benefiting uh, probably very few, and therefore she called for a more coordinated action in order to restore uh, the global economic growth on the path of uh, sustainability. Now, uh, I, I told Christine after the meeting that uh, with her permission, I was going to take this takeaway back to Vienna to share with my friends and colleagues in Vienna that this uh, correction, this cycle, uh, has really taken too long uh, for most participants, for most stakeholders. It's been too long, it's been it's taken too long, and therefore uh, it's also time uh, for us in OPEC, together with our friends from non-OPEC, uh, in a coordinated fashion to take some action. Uh, and this was the message I, 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 I took. Uh, to, to, to OPEC, uh, and we saw uh, both member countries as well as friends from non-OPEC uh, again coming together uh, on the same pedestal, if you like, uh, trying to uh, pull us out of this severe cycle. Yeah? And so what still needs to be done before? What's outstanding? Well, um, my friend Fathi is, 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 a, is, a soccer, is, is a soccer fanatic. Football. Football, you know. And uh, he, he, told me, he told me when I visited him in Paris, one of my first port of call when I assumed office in August was to go to Paris to meet him. Uh, uh, because this is an interdependent world, and both the IEA and, and, and OPEC, we have come a long way. Uh, 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 in this evolving interdependent world. And, and, he, and he told me, this is, this is half time. This is half time. Uh, so we, we've got maybe the, the second part of the match uh, uh, to go. Uh, in Algiers, we had, we, the, the, we had set up a high level committee, as you recall, of 14 member countries that will fashion out the implementation of the agreement uh, which set a target range 
of 32.5 million barrels a day to 33 million barrels a day for the APEC 14. And this committee uh, will meet in Vienna uh, from the 28th to 29th uh, of this month. And as part of the ongoing consultations, uh, we met in Istanbul a couple of days ago in the sidelines of the World Energy Congress. And uh, we agreed with our non-OPEC friends that they should also participate in this committee uh, in order to begin to put the building blocks, if you like, uh, for this framework of implementation uh, going forward. So we have agreed that we're going to meet ourselves, the OPEC 14, and then the following day we are going to meet with our OPEC and non-OPEC friends. Uh, and uh, this is how we will continue towards uh, our conference in November 30, uh, where we expect that uh, 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 the, all the building blocks would be in place uh, in a timely fashion uh, for, for, for implementation. So this is the second half of the match, <laughs> according to Fati. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much for the update and where we are. Yeah. Uh, Fatih, I want to turn to you now. If this cut comes off, or if OPEC reaches the target that they're laying out, how is that going to impact balances in the oil market, in your view? Thank you, Alex. First, uh, uh, let me add my voice to that of uh, Mohammed for uh, congratulating oil and money for organizing this event. It's a sustainable. Uh, I would say a uh, business, it shows that oil and money, 37 years, uh, excellent. And also publicly, let me congratulate the OPEC, there are many OPEC uh, members here for choosing such an excellent Secretary General like uh, uh, Mohammed. And I think we have seen in the last uh, few months, uh, Mohammed, uh, what a great uh, Secretary General uh, uh, you will be in the next few years, and, and you are uh, already. And we were very happy, as Mohammed said, the, he paid uh, one of his first visits to Paris uh, to, uh, to International Energy Agency, and I was very happy to host Mohammed and his delegation at uh, Paris at, at our headquarters. Now, coming back to the, uh, uh, the OPEC, of course, if uh, the, the OPEC initiative is a very important development in the oil markets, and uh, there is a target but I think the, the real work, the hard work starts now, the first thing. So who is going to do what, which country is going to do uh, what kind of uh, contribution to reach that uh, target? It has been discussed uh, before, once in Algiers, then in Istanbul, two cities with beautiful sea and inspiration. But in Vienna, you don't have the sea, so as, as you know, so we will see Hopefully, Vienna will also give some inspiration to Mohammed and his uh, colleagues. If this uh, uh, initiative goes successfully, it could well uh, put the upward pressure on the prices. And if that happens, uh, I see at least three important uh, consequences. One, if the prices move towards uh, $60, today, today we are about 52, we may well see a response from the high cost producers, including uh, United States. And if it stays at $60 and give the confidence to the investors, many of them are uh, watching the markets very closely and the OPEC news uh, very closely, they may uh, well uh, get on the job and we may see with a time like six months or, or, or longer, we may see a response from that. This is number one. Number two, there are some significant producers whose production is in a decline. For example, China. For the first time, we see a significant decline in China, about 500,000 barrels per day in the last year because of the lower prices. Colombia. <coughs> we may see those trends also uh, going uh, upwards. 
So both of them bringing more oil to the markets. And third, this year uh, we expect oil demand to grow 1.2 million barrels per day and next year similar expectation. Coming from last year, which was 1.8 million barrels per day, higher prices may also put downward pressure on the oil demand growth. So this is uh, another uh, issue that we need to think. So as a result of that, uh, this is a very important initiative uh, and it, in, it can well impact on the uh, prices but the changes in the prices may have impact on the, both on the production side and the consumption side of the uh, oil markets. So, I mean, you're, you're raising the, the issue that it may work too well and prices may go too high and we end up back in a cycle of oversupply. So there will be, a, there will be some market responses to the changes in the, in the prices. Uh, to me, uh, the best thing is uh, the uh, leave the markets uh, alone. Markets will, uh, the market forces should determine the, uh, the prices. And uh, if the prices uh, go up, there will be a definite reaction both on the production side and on the uh, consumption side. And as Mama said, there's a second half. And even in some cases, there's also injury time that many surprises happen. <laughs> So, so, so are you advocating then for no action or no action really needs to be taken to get these, these markets back into balance? I don't advocate for anything. Mohammed knows everything much better than me. So <laughs> uh, I leave it uh, to them to uh, take their own decision. But I am just saying mm -hmm. what could be the consequences of that as a result of those actions. And it's up to all the market players to position themselves uh, accordingly. Okay, so, it, so if there's no action taken, how long would it take? In, in, the way the balances look right now is supply and demand. With no action, how long would it take to rebalance the market? We publish every year an uh, oil market uh, uh, report, and the, the hero is there, uh, Peg McKay, and uh, she and her colleagues. And our analysis show that uh, without any OPEC uh, action, without any action, we expect the prices, the markets to rebalance uh, second half of 2017, if there is an action, it can be, uh, uh, of course, uh, faster rebalancing. Okay. And Mohammed, uh, is there a concern about prices going too high? I mean, it, it, is that part of the discussions here to be, to be sure that prices don't go too high to reactivate expensive or high cost of oil like U.S. shale? Uh, the, the, the Algiers Accord uh, was not driven by price expectations per se. The Algiers Accord was driven by supply fundamentals. Why? Because this cycle uh, was itself driven by excessive supply that we have seen, especially uh, from high uh, cost uh, regions uh, that uh, uh, triggered a strong buildup uh, that was probably unprecedented in recent times. So what we did was to take a decision that would aid the market in accelerating stock drawdown that will bring the market into balance uh, faster, as uh, Fatih has said, uh, than most of the, uh, most of the projections. And uh, we, we are hopeful uh, that uh, the trend that we started seeing uh, probably will continue. Uh, and uh, this stock drawdown will be accelerated. Uh, and the rebalancing will be, will be brought forward. OK. Yes. So the inventories, you think, can be brought down with just a single action. It won't be, you won't need a series of actions to bring down the inventories over time or a bigger cut to actually rebalance the market? No, the decision we took to peg our ceiling at a range of 32.5 to 33 million barrels for the OPEC 14, not to talk of the expected contribution from non-OPEC, uh, in our view uh, uh, will stimulate this stock drawdown in, the, in an accelerated fashion that will bring the rebalancing uh, forward uh, 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 much earlier than expected. Okay. Yes. Fatih, you agree? 
as far as with inventories? I think uh, in the absence of any action, uh, we expect inventories uh, the draw starts around the second half of 2017. Okay, good. Mohamed, I'll go back to you on looking a bit further in the future, uh, looking at um, what some people have brought up about a supply shortage coming up by around 2020. And um, yeah, th there's been a shortage of investment in the industry. I think maybe next year will be a third straight year where investment declines in the energy industry. Um, do you see that there's a risk of a supply shortage around 2020? Is there not enough being spent in supply to meet demands? I believe there is a, there's a growing consensus, uh, global consensus, if you like, in the industry, uh, including here in Oil and Money, talking to uh, distinguished uh, delegates all morning, that one of the fallouts of this severe cycle uh, is the contraction we have seen in investments, particularly in ENP, uh, in the last two years. Uh, and uh, the IEA uh, has uh, come out also uh, with a projection that uh, may see us having this contraction continuing into uh, 2017, making it three consecutive years uh, of uh, steep contraction of investments in E&P. Now, this, this is, uh, is, is a serious threat not only to current uh, production, but future production and, and supply. And as a result of that, you can see that the convergence of views, not only between producers in OPEC and outside OPEC, but now between producers as well as consumers, because it affects, it affects all of us. Uh, uh, hence the need uh, to restore balance in this market uh, uh, to restore uh, investments on a sustainable basis. Uh, according to our World Oil Outlook that will uh, be officially released uh, next month in Abu Dhabi, we estimate that to year 2040, this industry will need uh, in the region of $10 trillion of investments in order to sustain uh, production as well as supply. Now, if in just these two years we are seeing a continued uh, contraction, 26% in 2015, and 20, pro projected 22% this year, and further contraction next year, then the global community, uh, not only the industry, uh, should really uh, take this very seriously uh, and, and join hands uh, in order to, to, to ensure the much needed security of supply going forward. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I mean, in fact, the, the, other, the other leg of this, of course, is the demand side, which, which you flagged before is maybe not performing as, as well as people have uh, had expected. Mohammed brought up the, the issue of the IMF and the sort of low growth there. Uh, if by 2020 demand disappoints, and even if supply kind of maybe it's a little bit better than people think, then maybe we're not so bad off by 2020. Now, first of all, <clears throat> let me try to bring a concept uh, here, which is very important and not uh, sometimes uh, forgotten. We need to invest and increase the production, not only to meet the growth in the demand, but also increase the production to compensate the decline in the existing fields. This is important. In fact, this is perhaps, in terms of the, the order of magnitude, it is more important than the demand, for example. We think demand will grow 1.2, OPEC thinks the same, uh, around the same level. But every year, we are losing 2 million barrels per day as a result of decline in the existing fields. It means every two years, we are losing Iraq. Okay? So therefore, uh, the the, the main driver for me, the investment is uh, the compensated decline in the existing fields plus the uh, 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 demand growth. You see, demand growth is not 1.2, it is 1, disappoints as a result of the lower economic growth and, uh, and, and others. Uh, it wouldn't change the, uh, the very important message that Mohammed said, and I completely agree, the, uh, is 
I said last month in our report, three years in a row, we are seeing a decline in investments. Alex, this has never been the case in the history of oil. If there was a decline, the next year there is a rebound. And it is even, this was even uh, very uh, rare. But three years in a row, decline in investment, this will have implications because, I mean, the number of, uh, 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 number of uh, the new uh, discoveries, historically low. Number of projects which are sanctioned, historically low. And this will have implications in the uh, next years to come. And therefore, uh, I think it is something that we all need to bear in mind that the, uh, the investment uh, in oil and gas upstream it, uh, and, of course, uh, broader uh, is a major issue that we all need to look very closely. Yeah. And, and can, can this shortfall be filled with fast reactive shale? Or does it require the sort of long lead mega projects that the industry has typically gone back to to meet the sort of supply issue or, or the demand in the future? I mean, I mean uh, pardon, for Mohamed? No, 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 yeah, yeah, I'm very... Go, go, go ahead, please go ahead, no, no. Mohamed. Do, do, you want, do you want this one? Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, uh, shell, shell oil, uh, contrary to, to reports, uh, shell oil, tight oil, uh, has been playing and will continue to play uh, a, a very important role in meeting not only current demand uh, but future demand uh, uh, for, for energy. Uh, we have seen uh, the interplay of technology. Uh, we have seen uh, the interplay of new management techniques uh, uh, coming together uh, supported by uh, fiscal policies, uh, particularly of producing countries, uh, to uh, steer this revolution, if you uh, may call it a revolution, uh, in this part of the industry. A uh, few years ago, uh, in this same uh, uh, conference, uh, the buzzword was uh, peak oil, uh, peak oil and in similar conferences around the world. Uh, but the, 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 the coming uh, into uh, being of tight oil and the role that it has played uh, has totally debunked that, and thanks to technology. Uh, and for us in OPEC, uh, we welcome that. And uh, in addition to that, we are now advocating uh, for the deployment of such appropriate technologies also to conventional. Because the world will continue to need oil for the foreseeable future. Uh, hopefully demand will continue to grow and uh, uh, with the concerted efforts we are seeing uh, at the G20, uh, at the IMF, uh, BRICS countries, uh, in almost all fora, uh, 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 you can see concerted efforts being made by policymakers, uh, central bankers, uh, in order to restore uh, normal growth uh, to the global economy. Uh, by, 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 by extension, we will continue to see demand for oil. Uh, therefore, everybody has a role to play, both conventional as well as non-conventional. And, and markets are supreme at the end of the day. But everybody has his own role to play. And uh, we, 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 wel we welcome that. OK. Yeah. I, I want to go to questions, but I, I want to pick up one thing that uh, Mohammed said. So thank you if you have any questions. I'll go in one minute. But um, Mohammed was just talking about this peak demand question. And I know uh, there's been a lot of talk in the industry about climate policies and technology impacting future demands. Uh, most organizations, most oil organizations, the IEA and OPEC, also have projections of what demand looks like in the future, and it's huge. It's a huge uh, amount of demand. There have been questions, though, with technology and climate about whether those are actually accurate. What do you think uh, is going to be the impact of climate and technology on demand in the future, and should we worry about the current demand projections? First of all, uh I mentioned last year as well, let me repeat, there is no way 
escaping from the impact of climate policies for the entire energy industry. Everybody will be this or that way affected from the climate policies. Wherever you are, either directly or indirectly, we will be all affected from that. This is number one. Second, technology. Uh, Mohammed mentioned the technology on the supply side. He is right, the, the shale technology. But as uh, well as the shale technology, there are some demand side technologies which are uh, progressing, advancing very uh, strongly. And uh, one of them is on the consumption side, the, and the cars, electric cars, for example. However, it will be important to put the things in a context. Because I see, I read many uh, articles saying that thanks to electric cars, we will soon see a peak oil demand. To be honest with you, one needs to lump numbers very, very strongly. When you look at our numbers, okay, less than 10% of the growth in oil demand comes from the cars. It is mainly coming from trucks, aviation, and petrochemicals. Okay, so let me, uh, perhaps I speak too much of uh, numbers, but I, I cannot stop myself to give one number. Last year was a record year for the electric cars sales worldwide. More than 500,000 cars sold. It was, we have never seen that. But when you put in a context, it is less than one car out of 100 cars sold. One out of 100. Even if we assume, as of uh, tomorrow, every second car sold was an electric car, global oil demand will still increase. So therefore, one shouldn't mix the things uh, uh, very much and one should put the things in a, in a context. Uh, in, the, in a normal world, in a no drastic measures taken world, global oil demand will continue to increase and I hope we will see more electric cars in the streets, which are hopefully fed by the electricity with less carbon mix to make it cleaner. But I don't see a peak oil demand in the short and medium term. OK, thank you for that. Uh, we'll go to questions now. Any questions from the audience? I mean, you're probably about BBC World Service. Um, Mr. Novak, the Russian energy minister at the um, end of um, the last uh, meeting said that you will be inviting the U.S. also to the talks uh, next week in Vienna. Is, is that true or not? And then if so, who you are inviting? And what do you expect them to do? Because unlike Russia or other countries, there is no national oil company that will decide on cuts in the U.S. Who can uh, decide, or, nor a president who can strong arm uh, oil companies into agreeing in it to cuts? Who do you invite? Who are you inviting? And what do you expect uh, from that person to do regarding the cuts? Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, Alexander Novak, uh, uh, Minister Novak, uh, had. Uh, uh, I think in, in, in the press conference in, in Istanbul uh, was quoted as saying that uh, uh, the U.S. should also uh, have a seat at the table considering the fact that out of the nearly 8 million uh, incremental barrels of supply we have seen uh, from 2008 to 2015 uh, from the high cost uh, producing areas, uh, almost 6 million or so came from the U.S. Uh, I, I would, uh, uh, yes, I, I agree with those numbers. They also tally with our, our numbers uh, in, in, in OPEC, and I believe the IEA as well. Uh, but uh, since we, since OPEC started uh, uh, collaborating and meeting with non-OPEC, I believe in 1989, uh, I've got my senior sitting before me here. I was not born that time. Uh, 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 but accord according to records, they started a meeting uh, with non-OPEC uh, 
both Nordine and Alirio Para are here, maybe they can answer your questions more appropriately. Uh, for me, I, as, as a good student of theirs, I checked the records after our meeting in Istanbul, who and who had sat with OPEC since we started these uh, interactions with our friends. I think I, think I, saw, I, saw, I saw the state of Texas. Uh, uh, I saw Alaska on the list. I, I don't know whether Nordin invited them. I, do, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, I, I, saw, I, saw, I saw Alberta. Alberta on the list, but but this was in 1989. In fact, the Soviet Union was there, not Ru not Russia. So, uh, the the decision in Algiers was to was to was to uh, intensify uh, our consultations with our non-OPEC uh, colleagues and friends uh, in order to design a more permanent framework. Uh, uh, beyond uh, this interim, if you like, uh, agreement uh, that may last between six months to one year. We have to look beyond that. And beyond that, uh, there was consensus among us that w we needed to come much closer uh, on a sustainable basis with non-OPEC, uh, not just one off or when we have a cycle crisis uh, to invite them. We should have both meetings at the political as well as technical level. Uh, hence, we are beginning with this meeting 28th, 29th in Vienna with their representatives. And uh, Mr. Novak assured me in Istanbul that he was going to send a high-powered uh, uh, delegation. But for the rest of those who will attend, let us wait and see. Hello, Angelina Rasquat from Bloomberg News. Earlier, uh, we heard from um, the board member from Saudi Aramco, Andrew Gold, that all prices between 50 to $60 a barrel were enough to meet the supply needs in the next three to four years. And I was wondering if you agreed with this view. Who's the, who's the question to? Uh, to uh, Mr. Biro. Mohammed, for you again. In fact, you can probably answer that Me? one too. Well, she, she directed it, Mohammed, but you can answer after. So go ahead, Mohammed. No, she said for $50, $60. Okay, for you? $50, $60. Yeah. We agree. Okay. okay. We agreed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, no. There is space. So I think with the $60, we can see a significant amount of uh, oil coming in uh, United States, uh, uh, Canada. Uh, and also offset the steep declines in certain areas. Uh, and when we look at the demand prospects for the next few years, I think uh, this should uh, be uh, enough to stimulate production growth there. But uh, you mentioned 2020. Uh, there is a, a life beyond 2020. One has to think of the, uh, the, the, the projects uh, beyond those uh, as well. Nordin Aitlausin, member of the EIG board. Um, this is not a question, really. It's a response to an invitation of Mohammed to perhaps uh, help a little bit understand the reason why the United States has not been invited. No, I don't know. I, don't, I haven't seen the list. But we were told this morning by John Haas that the United States has cut already. So what OPEC wants to invite are the countries who are not cutting or probably refusing to cut. Having said that, I'm a little bit puzzled by Fatih's comment when the question came, well, would you support OPEC carrying on with the idea of establishing a ceiling? You did not want to comment, and yet what you said right after you know, another question was describing you know, the terrible situation in which we can find ourselves you know, in terms especially of security of supply down the road. I don't see the reason why the IAEA will not support what OPEC is trying to build together to come back to some nonsense. Fati, we're out of time, but you can answer briefly. <laughs> we are out of time. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> No, I mean, uh, 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 no, what I'm saying is OPEX business is OPEX business. Uh, they have a, a, a strong uh, secretary general. I'm sure he knows uh, 
how to uh, move the things uh, forward. But what I'm saying is, the I believe oil markets are best governed by the uh, market forces. This is what I would like to uh, say. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, I think with that, we have to wrap up. I want to thank both our speakers, Mahal Barkindo, Fatih Birol, for an excellent session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mohamed. Thank you.